What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash and today is April 23rd of 2020. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are. And if you're going to be watching a video summarizing what to expect from the having event, this is definitely the one you're going to want to watch. I'm not only going to share my personal perspective, but I'm really going to get down to the facts here of what we're working with in regards to the having event is this is not only the first having event for many, but including myself. So I put a lot of thought into understanding how it's actually going to work. So please stay tuned. This is going to be a very important video right after our quick sponsor. Our sponsor for today's episode is Bitpanda Pro. If you're on the hunt for a proven, trustworthy exchange in Europe to trade your crypto, then I recommend taking a look at Bitpanda. If you're just getting started, many people refer to Bitpanda as the European Coinbase, so it can be a great place to start in getting your first crypto positions. With over five years of experience serving the industry by offering easy and secure access to digital currencies, Bitpanda has really earned its reputation. Check out the link down below in the description for more information. Alrighty, everyone. So I want to go ahead and cut to the chase here about my opinion, not only what's going to happen before the having event, but also what's going to happen post having event over the next coming weeks and the next coming months to the next year. So again, if you stay tuned for my opinion on this, guys, please stick around for the rationale behind it, the evidence that I use to support that opinion. I want to see if you see eye to eye with me. It's very important that you make your own decision here because I'm just one voice at the end of the day. And that's exactly how you should treat me. It's just one voice. I'm not an oracle by any means and stuff. I've made right calls and I've made wrong calls. But let's just go ahead and dive straight into it. So there are gonna be three elements that we talk about here that are really gonna define my opinion. Technical price action, inflows and outflows, and generally the overall stock to flow model, okay? And I also wanna throw in a bonus in there that we're gonna talk midway about hash rate because this is a big concern for a lot of people going into the having event and I'll talk about that as we go through. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the longer term chart here. Now, why am I not only bullish going into the having event and why do I expect a correction post having event, but eventually in the longer term, a grand cycle for Bitcoin. Let's just go ahead and talk about the short term here first. And that has a lot to do with technicals. So we can see back here in early March, we had the worst week of sell side price action for crypto markets in a very long period of time. We had the second worst sell off day for Bitcoin in its history, the worst in seven years. But along with that as well, we had the worst sell off day for Ethereum as well. This is by percentage points. So we had a very big percentage drop here across the board for most crypto assets. And over the last really six weeks here, we've actually recouped a lot of those losses. In fact, we're almost back to where we were before the bulk of the sell side action started here in regards to this weekly candle, right? The day of reckoning for cryptocurrencies that we had. And now it looks like we're very much on our way to not only getting back up to that range, but possibly coming back up here to the upper $9,000 range. Now, why do I say that? Well, first off here, we can see consistently for the last six weeks, Bitcoin has been going up. Second off here, you can see very clearly that prices are starting to wedge in here on the shorter term, right? So it's a matter here of whether or not in the next 24 to 40 hours, we really close up with a breakout here and eventually get above $7,500. When this happens, I think it's very clear here that we're going to come up here and test this line of resistance. Again, looking at the longer term time frame, it probably becomes a lot more clear for people. A lot of people don't look at this, they're usually looking at the hourly, or if anything, the daily. It's not gonna provide you this kind of perspective, guys, because this wedge has been building up since all the way back here in 2017, from when we really kicked off the later phase of the cycle in 10X Bitcoin, and when we had our peak out at 20K. So again, you can see that these two lines show a lot of significance for resistance and support. Again, not many people focusing on this, but if we take it here to the daily, right, we really have a couple of weeks here for Bitcoin to get up to this range. Is it realistic for Bitcoin to do that? Absolutely. Uh, the reason why, guys, is Bitcoin just went from 4,800 upwards towards, you know, at the peak here around $7,500, right? It can make these moves. All we're really looking for here, it might look kind of big, but in reality, we're really just asking for Bitcoin to go up a little over $2,000 here to get up in the upper $9,000 range. And that goes all the way up into the mid part of May, basically in the middle of this green box here. Now, again, depending on when the halving actually officially happens, yeah, that might make things vary. But again, I think in this case, we've got plenty of room here. So we take a look at the last few weeks. I mean, it becomes a lot more clear here that you could see over the next two, three or four weeks that we really start to kick off Bitcoin's price and go somewhere between eight to 9,000, testing up somewhere near, uh, near this resistance range, like we did over here, like we did over here and over here for the fourth time. Now, Again, even though I do believe Bitcoin's price is gonna rise into the halving event, I believe afterwards we're going to have a correction. But there's a very important thing to keep in mind here. 
I do not believe we are going to come down and test this line of support like we've done historically. And this is going to be a very clear sign that, again, many people are so focused on looking at technical indicators, they're so focused in using uh, you know, Fibonacci retracements, a lot of these things, when in reality, price tells you more than anything. What's gonna probably happen after the correction is we're going to find a baseline of support somewhere actually about where we are right now, where prices are going to kind of push sideways here sometime probably in August or September. And what I think after is gonna happen there is it's gonna be a very clear sign after a few weeks that buyers are not selling for lower prices. You can set limit orders and say, I'm not gonna buy it at six or $5,000. But what really matters at the end of the day, the voice that matters is the current market price. And if market price is holding somewhere and it starts to curve upward and set higher lows and higher highs, this means that bulls, people who are buying, are not only outweighing any sell side pressure, but they are not settling for lower prices, right? They are getting it at the current rate and they're probably starting to pay a premium as prices go up. So in this case, that's a very important thing to talk about, a very key thing to keep in mind. So I believe we're going to get a rally into the halving event. We're gonna come down, pull back, set a higher low here from the previous lows, and it's not gonna make contact with the line of support. We're gonna get pressure against the line of resistance at a much lower level here. In this case, again, keeping in mind, the level is dropping, so it's easier to break this resistance. And once we do, this is going to kick off the next cycle. I do believe this is probably not going to happen until the fall or winter of 2020, if not into 2021. We will have to see, guys. Again, I don't wanna to get too eager on this. Just wanna be completely transparent and realistic. Now, we have 18 days until the halving event here. There are a lot of questions on people's minds. And the biggest one has to probably be hash rate, okay? So this is one of the bonus things that I wanted to talk about here. And it's one of the things that I see people, I think the issue is that so many people have sold this lie that Bitcoin's hash rate declining is somehow going to affect Bitcoin's price. That what happens for individual miners and their operations of turning power, basically turning their power on and off for their ASIC miners is going to affect Bitcoin at all or a drop in hash rate would have an effect on Bitcoin. None of this is true, right? And I can explain this because this data is public and we can line it up with price action. So let's just go ahead here and consider this, guys. Right now we are at $7,000. We're at a third, nearly a third in this case, not exactly, nearly a third of where Bitcoin's price was at 20,000, at the peak of the 2017 run-up, okay? Fair enough, very fair to understand that, right? It's all public. Now, if you take a look, again, this is public information, you can go to bitinfocharts.com and you can look at the public hash rate that's recorded from all of the mining pools that report their hashing power. and you can see a chart over time of a general growth. But let's just go ahead and step back. We'll go here exactly around this range here to the peak here, Bitcoin, which was towards the end of December here, right? And we get numbers hovering around 13 ex, um, exahashes in this case. So you can see over the years, Bitcoin has gone from terahashes to petahashes to exahashes, right? And we come to this value here towards the end of the year in this case where it's about 13. Right? I'll go ahead and get specifically here. This is where it was back in the end of December. So 13 exahashes. So that was the peak of the market. And we've been in a bear market, generally speaking. A lot of people's perspective, some people say, oh, we haven't even kicked off the next bull market, right? But right now, with prices practically a third of where they were before in the case of Bitcoin, the hash rate has increased almost tenfold. The other day, we were at a tenfold increase. We were at 130 exahashes. So, during this time period where Bitcoin has been going down, Bitcoin's hash rate has gone up 10 times. So what does this tell us? It tells us that an increase in hash rate doesn't really mean an increase in price, but at the same time, it also means that a drop in hash rate is likely not going to reflect a drop in price. They're not really in sync with one another. Bitcoin's hash rate in general has increased over time as interest in Bitcoin has grown and people constantly compete for these rewards. Now, do I expect that there's probably gonna be a short-term decline in hash rate? Absolutely. Just the other week before we had, we had the halving event, we already had a very stark decline here. I mean, just take a look at the last three months here, guys. You saw, for example, over here, this is a great example. Here on February 20th, in less than a month going up to March 5th, we had a 30% or greater increase in the hash rate. Did that really affect price? No, not really. And then along with that as well, we went from 133 exahashes down to 85 exahashes, more than a 33% decline. Did that destroy Bitcoin? 
No, it didn't destroy Bitcoin. These things happen, guys. It's cyclical processes for production of a form of a commodity at the end of the day. Bitcoin acts very much like a digital gold. And basically, people turn on operations and turn them off. Out of Bitcoin, out of any other asset in the world, when we're talking about these kind of commodities, Bitcoin has the most flexibility to be turned on and off in this case, comparative to running a massive oil drilling operation or refining gold. You can't just simply turn things on and off on a dime. So so in this case, Bitcoin actually provides a lot of flexibility to kind of wax and wane between these lows and these highs for hashing power. And overall, provide an opportunity for, to, for people to compete in this case for these block rewards. So again, keeping that in mind here. Now, just as important of a point here, guys, that I want to talk about, and we've discussed it before, is something I call inflows and outflows, okay? Now, this is a general topic. I, I call it that in this case, but this is talked about in practically every market because it is the base foundation of supply and demand that will determine where price goes. And we have to understand that the halving event cannot generally be priced in until it happens. Now, why do I say that? Why am I putting my money on that statement? Because of two things. First off, the vast majority of people in this world do not either own Bitcoin really understand Bitcoin, but most importantly, they sure as hell don't understand the having model. And that's not an insult. It's not an insult to you guys. You guys understand it if you're in this space. I'm talking about the vast majority of people who either have yet to get involved in cryptocurrencies, let alone get into the depths of understanding Bitcoin's supply model. Right? If you know about this, you are in a very select few people who actually understand this model. Right? You should be you should be you know proud that you actually are this deep in this new emerging space. And I applaud you guys for it. But to understand that as well, we, we have to understand that at the end of the day, because the world doesn't understand this, we can't have a completely sound market. I've heard a lot of people say that crypto markets are efficient enough to have this priced in already. Well, why didn't it happen at last two times? Why don't we already why didn't we last time when we had the having event or the two previous having events, why didn't we already price it in? Why wasn't Bitcoin already at a million dollars? That's a very flawed kind of logic to apply to markets because, again, the vast majority of the world does not understand Bitcoin. Even institutional investors don't understand Bitcoin. You have people like saying, you know, for example, just two years back, I remember when Jamie Dimon was coming on TV talking about uh, it's like digital gold, not really because, you know, gold is limited. When gold has one to two percent inflation every year and Bitcoin set on a track to have an absolute cap in its supply. These are the people we're up against, guys, people who are doubters of Bitcoin. So anyways, I'm, I'm rambling on. So let's just go ahead and get to this point here about inflows and outflows. First off, we have to understand that for price to maintain its general range it's at, so let's say we're working with a price of Bitcoin at $7,000. In order for Bitcoin to push sideways on a day-to-day -day basis, we need a consistent general equalization between buyers and sellers. Inflows, demand, and outflows, sell side pressure, sellers, right? So we first have to take a look at the sellers, right? And it's made up of two categories. There are first general speculators and investors who might be selling their positions. They might need cash in the short term. They might think Bitcoin is not going any higher. Maybe they're covering their positions. We don't know how much that is, that sell side pressure. The second aspect here, right, is the miners. Now, you will hear immense debate between people on this one. A lot of people say that all miners would hold all their Bitcoin, and the other end would say that all of them sell it because they're running on very thin margins. I would say I would favor the latter of those two. It's mostly that most miners are selling their Bitcoin. There are a few miners who produce at a cheap enough level that they decide to hold their Bitcoin, and they usually will lend it out to a lot of lending platforms where they can earn interest. But I digress. Basically, about two thirds are probably going to be selling it right away because a lot of these miners in the regions that they're at, especially in this competitive environment and especially going to the halving event, they're working on very, very thin margins. So important thing to keep in mind here that a lot of this is going to be sell side pressure. Now, we're just going to go ahead with the assumption here that all miners are selling at the end of the day. Okay, so 11.2 million dollars of sell side pressure here for Bitcoin on a daily basis. That means, not even including sellers, the buyers have to keep up with $11.2 million. They need to inject $11.2 million of buy side pressure for Bitcoin. That's traders, investors, hedge funds, family funds, uh, institutional investors, whatever it may be. There needs to be that much buy side pressure just to maintain with the sell side. And again, these numbers can vary a little bit. but. The main message I want to propose here is no matter how much of this is, whether it's 11 million or 6 million, 
The important thing to note is that after the halving event, that sell side pressure, one of the key selling components and downward pressures on Bitcoin's price gets cut in half. It gets cut in half. And generally speaking, and this number can vary, but you can see very clearly here that until that halving event actually triggers, you will not have that disparity between the buy side pressure and the sell side pressure that makes an absolute shift in supply and demand, right? So let's say again, we're at that 7,000 price for Bitcoin. We maintain generally the same amount of buy side pressure as we've been doing on a daily basis. The miners cut their production in half due to the halving event coming in. Doesn't mean that the miners aren't still you know, running the same hash rate or whatever, that's gonna vary, but there will always be a certain amount of Bitcoin mined on a daily basis on average. And that's gonna create half of the sell side pressure that we're getting from miners currently on average. So this is what leads over a course of multiple days, weeks, and months after the halving event into the cyclical process where there's a major shift in demand versus supply that leads prices higher. This is why the last two halving events could not have been priced in. It happens afterwards, especially seeing as most people don't understand it, okay? So I, I rambled on enough. I hope you guys get that concept in that case. It's very, very key. But the last thing I wanna talk about here, at the end of the day, in the sense of Bitcoin specifically, is where we are right now with the stock to flow model. A lot of people think that Bitcoin is nowhere where it needs to be. Some people think that it's overbought. And quite frankly, the stock to flow model says we're exactly where we should be, right? If we take a look here, back at the last timing event, this is July, uh, July 10th of 2016, we were hovering a little bit above the halving event before we crossed over, right? This is where we started to enter into the halving event in the summer 2016. So this was the last event we had, price roughly around here. If you, if you take a look here, we're gonna go ahead and reset the axes, the axes here. This is where we were, right? Right in line with where we should be at fair value of Bitcoin. Where are we at right now? We're exactly where we should be. Not a little bit above the line, but slightly below it. In fact, this pretty much means we're at a discount here in this case compared to fair value for Bitcoin around 78 to 7,900. And stepping into this halving event here, I have no doubt prices are gonna hang here for a little while, but it shows us we're exactly where we need to be. The big thing that a lot of people still can't comprehend, I think, that I've seen from a lot of the bears for the space who might've gotten back in the market here at 11, 10 to 12 or 14,000, is that we were not meant to get up this high here this quick. In the last cycle, we didn't have any time period back here during the rebound at the bottom of the phase where we actually got above the line until all the way back here into June with the anticipation of the halving event. So I think it's very reasonable to say we're at where we should be. I think it's very reasonable to say that we haven't seen the inflows and outflows change yet because we haven't had the halving event yet. That the hash rate is not going to affect Bitcoin at the end of the day. And that so far, price is signaling some very good strength here going into the next coming weeks where we're going to have this happening event. It's really in 18 days. It's less than three weeks, guys. It's pretty damn exciting. I have to say it. I'm sorry. It's a damn exciting time to be in cryptocurrencies. And I'm happy you guys are here with me to experience that. I think this is going to be a very fascinating time. We'll have to see how it all plays out. I could be entirely wrong about my price calls. But again, I rooted this opinion in all of the things that I can analyze from the market that are completely public and open to all of us. So the last thing I wanna ask is I'd like to hear from you guys. Do you agree with my position? Do you disagree? Please, if you leave a comment, if you leave some criticism, or if you leave some positive feedback, please leave it well detailed, well written out. I wanna hear from you guys. I wanna get your thoughts on this. And if you like the video, it always is appreciated if you drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, as well as hit the bell icon. I wanna have all of you here on the Data Dash channel and you know get this discussion going. It's always fun to talk about this. And it's gonna be a very historic time for a lot of us. I mean, we've already been through some very turbulent times. We're talking about the macro environment. I mean, that's one thing we didn't even get to discuss in this video negative interest rates on a global scale, possibly in the United States as well. What kind of effect is that gonna have on people who have trillions of dollars in savings accounts and treasuries that are gonna now start penalizing you for owning them? I'm pretty sure people are going to look for one of three assets that doesn't penalize you for holding it and doesn't print itself into oblivion. That's gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Those three assets are the only real assets that serve as a sort of hedge that provide those values and aren't really dramatically affected by supply and demand economics in the real world. They're non-correlated. 
So, anyways, guys, hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.